All right. You guys uh, been busy uh, finding lost dogs or, or abandoning them or something? Is that, is that what I'm hearing? <laughs> no. All right. Well, I hope you had a, a good Mardi Gras um, and Valentine's Day and all that. Uh, today we're going to pick back up and we have toys to play with. Um, so we'll, we'll take a quick look at a couple of these videos to kind of showcase what these are, but you can also come up here and play with them. So I'm going to give you, um, I'll go through some of that with you here in a moment. Um, we're also going to start talking about point of use treatment op options, starting with kind of the simplest sedimentation. So that'll be like the other part of the lecture. Today we're just kind of picking up where we were here with these slides and that's kind of the end of them. So these two videos I'll, I'll pull up. Um, they're sh basically teaching you how to use this thing. So we might skip around because I'm going to show you in person and that's kind of neat. But you'll be able to see a few things that they've got, you know, video and pictures of that would be pretty neat. So uh, with that, I will step over here and invite you up to, to kind of take a look at what's going on. Um, and then I, we'll, we'll see how it goes, but then I'll play the, uh, the videos for you, I think. All right. So come on up if you want to. This is the, the kit. It's, um, kind of heavy because it's, it's a car battery in there, basically. Um, portable integrator. And actually, you know, grab that table and bring it by. in 
the field that way. In order to do the filtration, we have fanciness. There's a um, elaborate device here that lets us load in a filter there at a um, gasket. Let's put in one of our filters, and you can see this is a good moment. <laughs> you put in the filter there, put the little ring on top of it, and then sandwich it. <laughs> Sorry, plastic pieces across the room, and then uh, mesh on there. Have this piece. Funny story, when I went to visit Nicaragua last year, um, they had lost a piece, which was this piece, which is kind of funny. It's like a little plastic tube. It's like, okay, what's the big deal? Well, we needed something, and we were able to find a tube like it, but it didn't have the little ring, so we were just sitting there like carefully trying to like keep it in place while we poured the water on. We made it work, but it was it was not ideal. It was just a little plastic piece made a difference. Because then you can squeeze it on like that, fill this up with your solution, and then the other fancy bits come to here, where we have a just a chamber. Right? It's this is gonna collect the water, we'll put this on, it seals got this O ring, it seals quite tight. And then we have a hand pump to apply a negative pressure. So we attach this guy here. And if I were to seal it all the way, maybe this would be the one that's not. Um, if we were to seal it properly, that would make a nice little vacuum and then a full water system. So then we have a way to have um, our filtered water, agriculture on the sink, and one of the, the neat things is, if you're doing samples like this, you think to yourself, oh, well, this is now dirty. How do I clean that in a way that's going like, to actually sanitize the system from an autoclave in the field? And you'd have to do that pretty much every sample or something, right? It's like there's some problems there. So what we do is we add just a little bit of methanol, um, a, a drop or two, light it on fire, add a drop or two in there, light it on fire, and then close it up like that, that causes it to, to do intricate combustion, and then you have formaldehyde from methanol in your combustion. Formaldehyde is a really potent food disinfectant, so it's, it's a neat system where you, you get to play with fire, you get to grow stuff, all, all the different things. How do we want you to start doing some other things? It also comes equipped to do like, I think that's pH, you can do turbidity, Check how far you can see through the water. This guy, it's kind of got a, a fancy suite of things. Normally, I just use it for the incubation part. Okay, so that's kind of that's like the the gist of it. Um, so, especially for those of you who are not coming on the trip, play with it. Come on over, play with it. I'll turn this on so you can kind of follow along a bit. Um, but feel free to ask any questions. Even has this little uh, um, magnifying glass for when you're counting the colonies. Um, they can be kind of small sometimes, so it's a little poke in there. Yeah, so look around. And if you've got questions, I think I've been you good, right? You're familiar enough, or is this a bit of a <laughs> <laughs> Like this. I feel like we were in 
34 friends and he like watched a video about this. Yeah. Too. So they do look like Yeah. Okay. So you're dead? Any questions or anybody else want to come? That's a good question. I think I think what you do is you probably not. I think what you would do is you would sink this into the water and see at what point can you no longer see what's inside. And the depth uh, will correspond to some amount of information. That's my guess. Well, that was Something like that. It's usually, it's usually some sort of visualization, like how far is it until you can no longer distinguish. Like we see the little checky disc thing, which is just like a, a circle with one color, then like a white and then black and white black kind of thing. Yeah. And at one point you can't really distinguish anymore. You see it, but you don't see the difference. That's the point where you say, okay, that's the distance. It's going to be something like that. So feel free to come back up if you wanted to take a look. We'll play this for a minute. I'm not sure I'm going to play it the full 11 minutes. Um, but it'll give you an idea kind of the operation here. Bubbles are no good. Bubbles are going to cause a barrier between the membrane and the food. And then you're not going to get the bugs growing. And that's going to cause a problem with the result later on. If you do end up with bubbles, there's two ways in which you can get rid of them. The first is to stab them with the end of your pipetta. That will get rid of the very large bubbles, but you'll notice it doesn't get rid of very many. So first thing you need to do is squeeze the end of your pipette and suck the bubbles out much like a vacuum cleaner. If you find you run out of squeeze, squeeze again, 
and suck them out. Until you're bubble free. And that plate is now ready for the membrane. Now we're ready to start processing the microbiological samples. What we'll need, obviously, is our sample water, filters, petri dishes that we prepared earlier, the filtration manifold, the vacuum pump, a lighter, and the forceps, and a China graph pencil to mark up the sample after we finish processing it. The first stage is to get the filtration manifold set for filtration. Turn the head upside down and insert it onto the vacuum cup and then turn the cuff around to the point whereby you can easily take, remove the two and hold them in one hand. Replace it on top of the uh, filtration manifold in order to ensure that the inside doesn't become contaminated. As you start to assemble the sterilized filtration manifold, on occasions the black rubber o-ring prevents the filtration manifold head from sitting into the vacuum cup. A good way to alleviate that is ensuring you press evenly across the base of the vacuum cup, push it on and turn it slightly. That should create enough suction to hold the head on. The next stage is to ensure that our forceps are sterile, just lightly flame those, and while there's a cooling, we can get set with a filter. Peel the two corners apart, peeling the clear plastic film uh, down the front and the white opaque backing down the back. You'll notice that there is the filter on the bottom, which is white and gridded, and on top of it is protected by a blue paper layer. So we don't use the blue paper? No, it's non-porous. Uh, it's only there, really, to protect the filter itself. You'll notice on the top of the filter, as you peel back the blue paper, there is a gridded sequence. That's in order to be able to assist you when you're counting in the analysis of the samples. Very carefully and gently grip the filter by the edge, ensuring that you don't try and crease or bend it. As gently as you possibly can, place the filter gridded side up into the middle of the filtration manifold brass disc. Okay. Now, rotate the locking cuff to ensure that the filter is held, the funnel is held in the vacuum position. Okay, taking our sample water and filling it to the 100 mil line, which is the top of the two uh, white scored marks on the actual funnel. Set the vacuum pump into the side port and then gently squeezing the pump itself you'll notice that it starts to pull the water through as part of a vacuum. Is it important for that to be quite slow? In general we'll measure a specific amount of water that we're going to filter there so we can then normalize okay we've counted this many colonies in 100 milliliters that are filtered. We could change that if we wanted to. We could do a liter if we did it 10 times, the filter might clog, but <laughs> we could potentially try to do that. Or we could say, okay, well, this is very dirty water. I'm just going to add 10 milliliters of water in there and filter that. So that, those are things you can do as a, as a way to dilute your sample in, in, a, in a sense. The turbidity of the water, which we've previously analyzed, will have an impact on it. <laughs> However, the, if you go too fast, there are certain likelihoods where you will cause the filter to either rumple or crease, uh, and then sometimes you can end up with a mild compromise level filter, in which case you'd need to run that process again. Okay, as the water starts to pull through and get nearer to the end of the filtration, Can 
you'll start to see the surface of the water evaporate away from the filter. It's important not to suck too much air through the filter after it's finished that, the um, suction. If you dry it out too much, that might actually harm yeah. the bacteria. Remove the vacuum pump. And again, showing that our tweezers are sterile because we don't want to be introducing contamination from the tweezers. Release the locking cuff to the point whereby, again, it's easy to lift both off in one hand. Gently remove the filter from the top of the brass disc. Again, being very careful to hold it only by the edge. Place the filter funnel and cuff back on, and then rolling it from one side to the other in order to try and prevent air bubbles, place the filter on top of the saturated pad, ensuring that they overlap as exactly as is possible, so you don't end up with overlapping edges. Place the lid on the Petri dish, mark the sample with the China Graph pencil, and return it into the stack. Okay, the first thing to do in this stage is to turn the incubator on. Okay, so then I think it's turning it on, putting them in, and making sure the temperature is right. <laughs> Skip that part. Um, but then when you count them, um, got this one to show us there. So your samples would have been incubating for anything between 16 to 18 hours. The next thing to do is to turn off the incubator and then take your samples out and begin counting them. This needs to be done within 15 minutes, otherwise your samples may actually cool and this may cause the colonies to change colour and will affect your results. So once your plates are all laid out on the table, the first thing to do before you actually start counting is to check your two controls have worked. The first control is the media plate control. So this would be a sterile filter pad followed by two mils of hopefully sterile media and then topped off with your sterile membrane. Following the incubation, if this plate has got no colonies on, this means that your media was in fact sterilized correctly and you can trust the rest of your results. The second control would be the filtration apparatus control. So following the sterilisation of your membrane filtration apparatus, you would then put a sterile filter pad at the bottom of this dish, followed by clean water run through your hopefully sterilised apparatus, then topped off with a sterile membrane. Following incubation, if this plate has no colonies on, this means that you've correctly sterilised your filtration apparatus and you can trust the rest of your results. Once the controls have been looked at and checked and you can verify that they've worked, the next thing to do is to start counting your colonies. From a previous run, we found that this particular sample was heavily contaminated and we were unable to count the colonies. If you find that this is the case of your samples, you can always dilute them with clean water in order to isolate individual colonies, which are much easier to count. It's also best practice to run all your samples in duplicate. This way, when the results come out, you can compare them, and if they're very similar in counts, you can then eliminate the possibility of human error. When it's time to start counting your colonies, you need to find the plates that have between 3 and 300 on each plate. You also need to find the ones that are between 1 and 3 millimetres in diameter. This is made slightly easier by the fact that the membranes supplied with the kit have gridded squares on, and each square is three millimetres in width. You can also use these lines to go along and count your colonies, making it a bit easier if there are a lot on the plate. Alternatively, you can actually split the plate into four quadrants and then count each quadrant individually. Sometimes colonies can actually merge together, making it difficult to count. If this is the case, you could use the hand lens supplied with the kit and use this to zoom in and decipher how many have actually merged together. The other thing to look for when counting your colonies are the yellow colonies only. These are the thermotolerant coliforms that we're looking for, which are able to produce a particular type of acid which lowers the pH of the media, rendering the colony yellow. 
The pink colonies are the types of bacteria that we're not really interested in, and these aren't able to produce that acid, and they remain the same color as the media, pink in color. Once you've decided which colonies to count, all results can be recorded in the daily report sheet found at the back of the Delagno manual. All right. So that's, uh, that's kind of how it works. Any questions or anything? All right. I think it's pretty common. There's a, a common dye that you can add to media that that does that. And I don't I don't recall the exact details. I mean, she kind of summarized it there. But I think you could add it to different media. And then it, if you do if you do incubate at 44 Celsius, which is kind of what that's targeted at, you can get that distinction between thermotolerant and non. Otherwise, you're kind of getting total coliform counts because we could incubate it at 37, just see what grows. That's still a decent indicator for how much bacteria is in some place, but the thermotolerant, they do that specifically to try to get a little bit better assessment of fecal origin. Um, that, that's the uh, idea. Um, yeah, and they, they have media, so that's something that um, we will likely prepare beforehand or perhaps the first day we're down there, prepare some to, to use that, that week. Okay. Any other questions? All right. So we'll have a, at the end of class, maybe a four or five minutes check in with the, the traveling group. So see me after class just to check in. All right. I think we, we wrapped up here. We did probably talk about these. You know, we can find WHO guidelines. They may have been updated since then. This is, uh, this book is, I'm getting close to 20 years old now, and I just scanned it from there. So there might be some updates, but in general, we could see, you know, arsenic. We don't want much of that. Um, none of it, if possible, but there's some guidelines where we might say below that should probably be safe. Um, fluoride, nitrate, E. coli, these thermotolerant coliforms. Um, and you'll notice there that both of them, they're suggesting we have zero in every 100 milliliters. <laughs> Right now, you could you could maybe say uh, we could filter, uh, you know, a cubic meter, see, you know, and, and find some number there. But um, typically, our scale is about this, right? We we measure 100 milliliters. If you're going to take a drink, you're going to drink a few hundred milliliters, maybe, or something. It's not, you know, we're not going to if we don't count any in there or close to none, Close to nothing, we're probably in pretty good shape. All right. Okay. Okay, so like to talk a bit about point of use technologies and kind of start thinking a little bit about um, you know, what it takes to actually implement some new technology, right? So if I were to pass out some new gadget, right? There's a good chance some of you will be very intrigued and some of you will be not very interested. If it's some new fancy, I don't know, some iPhone-like product or something and you haven't seen something like it, right? Some of you might be like, what the heck is this? I don't feel like wasting my time learning, figuring out what this is. But a month later, once you're, all your friends are using it, you'll be like, oh, I can kind of see, that's pretty cool, maybe I'll try it, right? Some of you will be like, oh, I want that, that's the new tech, new tech. I wanna, I wanna be all in on that, right? So that's, that's just something that happens with people. Um, and you might find yourself somewhere along the line there, early adopters, late adopters, you know, if, if we take a look at um, like a typical profile for a new technology, we have, you know, the, you might say the innovators, the, the super early adopters and the early adopters. Um, and, you know, if we just categorize it all early majority, late majority, and then some uh, <laughs> laggards is what the <laughs> plot says, right? So people that just are dragging their feet. And, you know, this stereotype, 
the stereotypes these days, you know, oh, the boomers or whatever. Um, but really, you probably could give that label to young people too that just happen to have that sort of a disposition, right? It's probably mostly just a personality thing, right? Some people, you know, people are different and, and in fact, there's probably good value to for all of that, right? Some people that are skeptical, there's, there's certainly times to be an, an use in skepticism and there's time and use for optimism, right? So it's probably a good thing that's uh, um, beneficial differences there. Um, but in general, a lot of people don't like to change, um, especially when it comes to something as fundamental as like food or water or things like that. So when we talk about water treatment technology, it's actually probably good to keep in mind that if you're going to change somebody's life, if you're thinking you're going to come into some village and you don't know these people and you're going to tell them that they're doing life wrong and you're going to tell them how to do it right and it's going to be really inconvenient, but it, it's better, I promise. It, that's not a very good sell, right? But if you think about it, that's what a lot of people have done in, in, in some cases, right? There's, um, I think the second time I went to Nicaragua, I had an interesting experience. I, we had a chance to go... Um, we joined with Amigos for a while, and then we took a, a day or two to go to Southern part. And we got to meet up with this, um, this organization that were, they were making these ceramic pot filters. So you'd be able to use local materials, get these ceramic pots and do filtration. And it was like, hey, that's kind of a cool idea. Maybe you add some silver nanoparticles to help with the disinfection or something, and hopefully that's safe. Um, and their whole thing was, hey, we're going to give cleaner water, you know, instead of taking from this open well, you know, you can get these ceramic pot filters and they'll filter enough water for you throughout the day to, to drink from it. Probably not quite enough volume to cook from, but at least, at least, you know, some things like that. And if you stop and think about it, you know, it, it's kind of a, a cool thing, a nice thing, and probably has some health benefit. But if you were able to invest those resources into one like deep well system producing water, the cost benefit there in my mind was, you know, having just come from that approach with Amigos to this other, I think it was Comunidad Connect or something. Um, it was very, very much a stark difference in their approach. Um, and I, I don't want to say there was no value there, but it did give me the feeling like, well, is, how much is this helping people? Right? Is this one of those cases where you're like, oh, you should filter your water. Here's a filter. You, here's how to make it. Helpful things, but at the end of the day, if it's only producing 10 liters a day, that's, and, and you still have to like carry the water, put it in there, make sure you're keeping everything sterile. You have to clean it every few days and things. It was, and, and actually, we're going to talk about something quite similar today, probably better than nothing. So, so I really don't mean to knock them. Um, or, or say that was worthless, but it's something to think about as we bring some technology Is it adoptable? Is it going to be usable? Are people going to see the value and the perception of value is going to be very important? You know and that there's a big Component of education that's required for development work in that sense that if people don't know what's causing them to to be sick Probably know that they don't want to be sick, right? But perhaps they don't even know that not being sick is an option, right? Um, that's there. There are likely cases where people. That's just how they how life is, right? And so there's there's quite a lot that can um, that go into that, and a lot of awareness that would go into what would make make somebody be an early adopter or a late adopter. In addition to just simply the um, <laughs> the natural way of humans being humans, right? Some some stubborn and some you know all that. Okay, so then thinking about technology and adoption, community buy-in is really key. Uh, and you see that with, you know, the, again, the example of like iPhones, for, for instance. People that don't have an iPhone are inevitably castigated for not having an iPhone as soon as you join a, a group chat of some sort, right, or a group text, because everybody wants to, you know, you, oh, you're the, you're the other color, it's, that's... You're an outcast. You should feel bad and buy this other product. So they, they've literally brainwashed everybody to to do the marketing for them, right? It's like, here's something that doesn't actually matter to anybody. 
but now we're all going to feel like it's valuable and we're going to ostracize you until you join the club. <laughs> okay, sorry. Off, off my little soapbox here. I'm 99% I'm just teasing about that. You know, just a tiny bit of bitterness there, right? <laughs> um, but it's, it goes to show kind of what marketing can do, right? And what, what, how humans relate and how important the buy-in is. And, and honestly, that community buy-in, there's something important there, right? And, and we see that in such a trivial example of the text message case, but, but we see that that's exactly that phenomenon, right? So if, if your community is buying into it, um, encouraging it, you know, embracing it, that's, that's huge, right? So that's a, a critical import, critically important part of, um, if we're going to do some sort of technological intervention, that's gotta be there uh, in some way. Okay, so part of that will be believing that it works, right? The germ theory of disease, we take it kind of for granted because we've been learning about it for a long time, um, but not everybody has, has the type of educational opportunities we have. Not everybody has a system like this, they could, they could test something, right? You could, you know, if you were just hanging around, had nothing better to do, you might, I don't know, spit on the filter and see what happens, right? You, you could do a lot of things to t test for yourself and to try you know try to use a little thing can I see the individual things or you know uh, uh, having a microscope to see microbes right things all that kind of stuff um, that type of a um, education uh, is perhaps something that can can help with that um, and would be very important for people recognizing and believing that um, I say belief, you know, it, in a sense, like how many of you have looked at microbes under a microscope? So if you've worked with in a lab like that, maybe, right? So a couple of you. The rest of you are kind of taking it for granted that there's microbes there because you've not physically observed it. Now, clearly there's a lot of people that have done so. There's a lot of pictures, images and all that. But you've also not ever taken that microscope and watched as overnight it becomes that colony, right? So there's actually a lot of trust, belief in that. I'd say that's usually pretty appropriate. <laughs> um, but in that sense, we're, we're the same, you know, humans are humans. We're going to have to place our belief in that. And how do we build to that? How do we get to that? Um, certainly the, the tangible or visible actions that we can take to show this are, are going to be hugely helpful. Okay, and that we could go quite far into the philosophy of science and learning and all of that down that rabbit trail, but we're not going not gonna to go there this moment. But good to, good to think about what it takes to, to bring somebody on board with um, how, to, how to be healthy. Okay, so another aspect as we think of the technology itself is, is it intuitive? Are we able to operate it? I've got a sneeze coming, I think, so... Apologize. <clears throat> are there instructions that are simple, usable? Can you, can you plug it in and use it? Does it require a lot of maintenance? Is it sturdy? You know, if you, if you look at this thing, I don't think I'm gonna travel with it just like, hey, here's my luggage, you know? But it's built to be pretty sturdy. You can kind of feel that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna add some protection and pack it in a suitcase or something, but you could almost think about just sending that on the plane as it is, right? Just lock it up and, <laughs> and send it. Um, you want something that's, that's not easily broken. You want something that if you lose a plastic piece, maybe you can still find a way to, <laughs> to make it work, right? Um, that's, that's the ideal that, um, that that would not be one, you know, your weakest link there, if that breaks and the whole system fails, that, that can be a problem. All right, so I'm going to start with sedimentation. I think we've you probably all seen this in 3110. Um, I know I teach this slide exactly, so I'm going to go pretty quickly through it, but I want to bring us back up to speed in case any of you haven't or you know haven't thought about it in a while so that we could do some basic calculations with sedimentation, right? So sedimentation will be our first topic when we can use gravity, we ought to use gravity because it's pretty cheap, right? It's, it's available. So the point of sedimentation will be, can we take mostly our, our particulate matter in water? So this would be the case where we have water that's really not great to use, 
in terms of it'd be much better if we could get groundwater that doesn't have much particulate matter but maybe we just have to get it from a shallow well or from a river or something sedimentation would be kind of the option right so it's going to have a lot of larger particles they can settle if we give them time so a sedimentation basin in a, a larger design would be something that's flowing through and giving them plenty of time water quiescently flowing through plenty of time for particles to settle out so on a big scale we would design that for flow through on a point of view scale we're probably going to design some kind of a bucket uh, or a bucket system where it's going to operate in batch we let particles settle and maybe as we'll see have a multiple bucket thing where we do some sedimentation transfer after a day transfer after a day and have kind of a sequential sedimentation um, there's several reasons for that so in order to better understand what filter you know what effect we're actually going to get you know what level of filtration not filtering but you know the effective what particle sizes are we going to be able to remove we want to do a, a force balance to say okay what's affecting sedimentation what are the things going on here um, and so we'll go through that with particles we're going to make some assumptions here to simplify things get a nice pretty straightforward formula we could use um, maybe something i'll give you on a on the exam i'd give you the equation and and all that but mostly i want to i want to be connecting here the reality of what's in place to a bit of theory right theoretically what could we do for that situation so that's that's the point here uh, for this this lecture so if we've got particles of random sizes and shapes one thing we can do is assume that they're all spherical that realistic not exactly but is it close enough well, for a lot of them yeah um, and so that would it would actually work work okay so then we're going to consider what forces are acting on a particle suspended in water well one would be the force of gravity um, one would be a buoyant force how much water is that displacing and how how much um, what's the mass of the water dis displacing compared to mass of this particle that's going to give us our buoyant force then and, and that's basically because water wants to come underneath it if it's if it's lighter or you know kind of come over it but there'll still be that that water displacing or water displacement okay so um, then finally if we do have movement one way or the other we'll have a force of drag and if we're assuming we're sedimenting then we're going to be assuming that that force of drag will resist the downward motion right so it'll be an upward force of drag all right so we could define all of these you know fg fb fd to find a terminal velocity just like skydiving right you, you jump out of a plane and at some point you reach a terminal velocity because the force of drag is opposing the force of gravity so it's like 180 miles an hour or something like that so you're going pretty fast but you you reach that terminal velocity and then you're just going that fast for a while so hopefully you have your parachute right that's that's the plan anyway okay um and then your terminal velocity changes because you have a lot more drag right and then then your parachute is you know has decreased your terminal velocity quite a bit all right so then force of gravity we would call that uh, the mass of the particle times the gravity of the particle but we don't really measure the mass too often that's kind of hard with small particles so instead of using the mass we're going to use stuff that we can more easily estimate from bulk measurements which would be the volume of the particles um, and their density so we can get you know if density is mass per volume multiply that by volume we get mass right so you could collect a bunch of particles in some water measure how dense they are and say okay here's our density and you could get pretty easily a size description of your particles either you're doing some sort of filtration or some light scattering techniques can get that that's that's something that can be achieved relatively easily a lot easier than grabbing an individual particle and weighing it that's for sure um, okay so then and we know gravity uh, I guess we could explore sedimentation on Mars and that would be 
more difficult with less gravity, but you know, that would be a different story. Okay, so force of buoyancy is very similar, um, except the only difference is we're going to use the mass of water. So if we already have the volume of the particle, then we can still use that for the volume of water that's displaced. And then with temperature, we know the density of water. So we're going to have a lookup table there, and we can get that. The force of drag then, uh, this is derived, thankfully we're assuming a sphere, so we can derive it that way. I'm going to skip the derivation part and just say that's three times the dynamic viscosity of water times pi times the velocity that's, you know, that terminal velocity times the diameter of that particle. So it's relating, relating to the cross-sectional area of that particle and how fast it's going through the water. So the, the thing here is we can take that term and say that's our, when we find a force balance here, this, this is the terminal velocity. So we'll say that's when the force of gravity equals the sum of the other two. Okay, so that's our sedimentation velocity. And if we solve for the condition where Fg is equal to Fb plus Fd, then we get an equation for the sedimentation velocity. And the particles are going to reach that pretty quick. You know, there will be some acceleration at some point, but it's going to be such a short time frame before they, you know, they're not going very fast. <laughs> so it won't take them long to reach that sedimentation velocity. And then hours and hours later, they'll have sedimented. Right, that's kind of the deal. <clears throat> okay, so here's a bunch of units and definitions for us. They're all about what we just said. Um, we generally put everything into meters, even the particle volumes. You know, it's a very small amount of cubic meters that one of these tiny particles occupies, but it's just convenient to go ahead and put it in meters since most of our units like dynamic viscosity are in meters. So Generally, we'll just follow, for convenience, kilograms, meters, and seconds, right? Which is, you know, the, the lookup table that I typically use to teach this stuff has reports it in that. So then we'll get a settling velocity in meters per second. That's usually something like times 10 to the minus fourth or fifth meters per second, right? So it's going to be like, you know, one thousandth of a meter in a second. So it would take a thousand seconds to go a meter, something like that, right? Around that amount. And if we could do that calculation, you know, that's maybe 10,000 to 10 of the month. Oh, I'm sorry, 10,000 to 100,000, that range. Um, so 10,000 seconds, we could do that calculation. And that should be some manner of hours, right? Um, okay. All right. So really the, uh, the things we need to look up or, so look up would be the density of water and the viscosity of water. Both of those will be temperature dependent. Then we need to find or estimate the diameter of the particles. And once we have that, we could estimate their volume. So these, these two go in hand in hand. Um, again, if we assume they're spherical. Yeah, and then we'd need some information about the density. Okay, so with all of that, then we can we can do our force balance. So if we if we take these um, these three equations we took a look at, let's go ahead and set them equal. So we'll say mass of the particle times gravity is equal to the volume of the particle times the density of the particle times gravity. Sorry. I, uh, I'm going to go ahead and just use everything on the right side. I was, yeah, we're going to, we'll start with this. So we're just going to say Fg is that. So I'm going to say that, set that equal to here and here. So we're going to set that equal to the, the buoyant force, which is the volume of the particle times the density of the water times gravity adding the drag force here, three times mu pi Vs and diameter of the particle. And we want to solve for Vs, right? We want, we want to know how quickly this particle is settling. That's uh, what we're after. 
Okay. We could probably design parachutes by doing the same type of equation, by the way, essentially. Okay, so we're going to work towards solving for Vs. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and pull this term over to the left. Really, I'm just going to subtract this guy from both sides and just swap sides for this. So I'm just going to put 3 mu pi Vs dp is equal to vp rho p minus vp rho and I should have had a g there sorry sorry okay all right, so now we have basically the volume of the particle shows up twice. Um, gravity shows up twice. So we can kind of rearrange this just a bit and say that's going to be the volume of the particle times gravity times the difference in the densities. So the density of the particle minus the density of the water, which kind of makes sense. Like that's the real driving force, for, at least from um, in terms of the buoyancy versus gravity, right? It's like, what's the difference in density? And that just makes intuitive sense, right? You could you could know for your for certain what's going to happen if I toss this water bottle as it is sealed into a swimming pool. What's it going to do? It's float, right? We know that. So it's like obvious to us without thinking a second thought, right? It's, it's got a lot of air in it. Of course, it's going to float. Um, so it's it's just that that intuition, and we see it showing up here. All right, so then let's take all of this and go ahead and isolate Vs. Vp times gravity, the difference in those guys. Divide all this by 3 mu pi times dp. Now, if we add in here the equation for a volume of a sphere, we can actually simplify quite a bit. So volume of a sphere in terms of diameter. Let's see, that should be pi diameter cubed is it over six, I think, or is this, am I missing something? Is that it? What's the volume of a sphere? We all should, we all should know this. <laughs> Shouldn't just be me up here guessing. You should guess too. Or Google. That would work too. Four thirds pi r is cubed, right? I think I think that's exactly right. Four thirds or is it four thirds or three fourths? Pi. It's four thirds. <laughs> four thirds pi r cubed, right? So then if we take r is you know uh, we'll say two r equals diameter, right? <laughs> So if we, if we want to replace the r in the diameter, we say r is one half diameter. So if we take one half diameter. So if we take and cube this, two cubed becomes eight, right? So this becomes um, four over three times eight times pi d cubed, right? That would be the right way to convert it. So we get, well, 8 divided by, 4 divided by 8 is 1 half, so we'll just end up with 1 over 6. Okay. Good. We're not crazy, and we did remember how to do it. Got to, got to prove it to myself sometimes. I'll put you on the spot, too. Okay. So we're good there. So then what happens here is we can say, instead of having a volume up there, we're going to go ahead and insert that diameter cubed, leave the gravity, leave the density difference, and we're going to add that 6 down below, so that 6 times 3 becomes 18. Oh, and we need pi also. Who doesn't want pi? Um, this equation doesn't, apparently. 
Um, okay, so then pi's will cancel, and dp's will cancel a little bit, so we'll be left with two there. So then our overall velocity equation would be the gravity times this difference times dp squared over 18 times mu. Okay, so we get some handy equation. We see where it comes from. We made some assumptions. Um, I'm not gonna ask you to derive all of that, but you can kind of see where that comes from pretty easily. And, and what we notice here is the diameter of the particle matters a lot. So if we think about what's gonna affect our particle, sedimentation, how fast is it gonna sediment? The velocity here we, we notice is related to the diameter of the particle as a function of a square, right? Or to the square degree, whatever, however you say that. Um, we could increase the gravity. In fact, that's kind of what we do artificially with centrifugation. So that would be if, you know, if we double the effect of gravity by centrifuging, then that, that doubles the effect. We could change the density, make it a denser particle. That would have a direct impact. <clears throat> we could make the, the stuff less viscous. So if you were trying to sediment something in honey, that would happen a lot slower than in, in water, right? Um, so you could maybe change the viscosity a bit, increase the temperature, but none of that has nearly the effect of increasing the particle size because that, that component is squared. Um, so if we can do anything to cause particles to become larger, that's um, the preferred method. <clears throat> Okay, so in, I mentioned this, but in a <coughs> commercial scale systems, and I, I suppose we could try to do something in a smaller scale, <coughs> continuous flow manner. So it could be appropriate or uh, applicable for kind of, maybe not point of use, but decentralized, like small scale systems. Maybe something to clean up the water a little before, you know, people store it or, or take from, something could be relevant, maybe some sort of a retention pond. Essentially, if we have water flowing through and we have particles, we want them to be able to settle to the bottom of whatever chamber we have before they exit. Um, and so what we would design is a, a system where we have some sedimentation velocity that we know that is going to give us, you know, our system has to be just big enough to make sure that the particle settles before the water leaves. We don't actually need it to be bigger if this is the specific particle we want to remove. So we typically have some design. We're not expecting to sediment viruses, for example. They're just way too small and they're probably not very dense compared to water. So they're just never going to settle. We, we assume that. So some things we're just never going to try to settle. Um, so we'll set some threshold. Maybe we want all of the silt particles. So anything that's like muddy clay kind of stuff, right, of some size. Say, okay, we want all of that out, and that's going to take out some of the bacteria with it, and we'll call that good enough. At least we won't be drinking something that looks like mud, right? Maybe that's our design criteria. It's not perfect treatment, but sometimes that's, that's what we want is that amount of treatment for what we're doing. So we could design a system that way. Um, that's for the case of a flow rate. If we think about just a bucket, it's almost the same thing in that we just need to give it some amount of time. Because in a, in a flow through system, we have hydraulic retention time. So if we, if we think of hydraulic retention time is important for flow through systems, I often label that as theta, um, then in a bucket, we just need a amount of time it's just sitting there undisturbed, right? And careful not to shake that bucket or bump the, <laughs> bump the table or whatever to, to jostle it and induce some sort of turbulence or, or movement, right? You wouldn't want that. So in a stagnant or in a like batch type of system, we just need some time. Whereas in a flow through system, we need some theta, some hydraulic retention time. But the point of both cases is we need that particle to reach the bottom before we're gonna use the water. Okay, so let's take a quick example, um, give you something uh, to, to use, use pen and paper for. 
So imagine we have a 55 gallon drum and it's going to be used as a sedimentation tank for water um, for, to be used by a couple of homes. The water is filled to one meter in depth. How many minutes will it take for all 0 0.01 millimeter salt particles to settle out of solution if their density is 2.2 grams per centimeter cubed and the water temperature is 25 degrees Celsius? So I give a, a bit of a lookup table here. Notice the units. Um, where'd my cursor go? The units for the viscosity include a times 10 to the minus 3, so don't, don't miss that. I give you the formula we derived here, and we have the lookup table for 25 Celsius. So take a few minutes to do that just to make sure you're pretty comfortable with this. Um, basically need to find that sedimentation velocity and then apply it to the, the condition condition there.
Did I get an answer yet? What did we get? That's for the uh, how many minutes? Well, it might be 226. Okay. Okay, meters per minute for the 8.0 stuff. Gotcha. Okay, how about uh, velocity in meters per second? That's where I got to. Okay, seems like the right order to me. Did you have these numbers that follow basically? Okay, so the, the potential tricky parts here is just simply recognizing, ah, I gotta do some unit conversions here, making sure you did the unit conversions with like the centimeters to cubic meters is a little tricky. There's a bit of a shortcut sometimes, um, you know, we often, if we're having a particle settle, we know it should be nearly the same as the water, but bigger. So should be on the order of a thousand. So if you got 2.2, it's probably 2,200. <laughs> um, worth going ahead and checking through the math, but you know, we've got that, we've got the gravity, we've got to check the, okay, what is the 0 0.01 millimeters in meters? You know, I had to take a moment to think about that, for example. So we're pretty, pretty much in agreement here. Okay, so then we take that 7.37 times 10 to the fifth meters per second. We're trying to calculate the minutes, so it makes a lot of sense to convert that into how many um, meters per minute. And this is, so this 8.07, does that have a time stem to the something? That seems like, yeah, th that, that number probably doesn't follow exactly right. So we'd take this one and say times 60 seconds per minute um, is one way we could do that. So we're gonna pause, pause on this one here. Um, So we can get a value there and then say, okay, well, in for, to one to get one meter, so we'd say one meter divided by the Vs in meters per minute should give us the amount of minutes. Right? Okay. Okay. So good. Hopefully that's uh useful. All right, I think, I think I've got more to say about what that means we could potentially remove and kind of some thoughts on how we might do that practically speaking. Um, but that's all I want to say for today. So we'll pick up here next time. So if I can see the uh, Nicaragua group after just briefly. Um, otherwise, have a good weekend.